To our daily gun show, we come to you live every weeknight at midnight for this live discussion. Uh, we do the uh, short show at mid at noon, so uh, we get together. We talk about guns. We run it live on YouTube and simulcast it over at GunChannels.com, a community we built five years ago now for gun conversations. We've got a bunch of people joining us from all over the country. Looks like uh, David just joined in from Florida. Thanks for joining. Yes, sir, G. Not a problem, sir. Yep, we got Dead Horse jumping in from Utah. Howdy. Thanks for joining. We got uh, Woods coming in from uh, state of Washington. Thanks for joining. Thanks for the invite. And John Gunsnob down in Oklahoma. Yep, thanks for the invite. Always. I'm around here in Tucson, and we've got some links out to others. Uh, Ellis is doing a live show right now, again, on YouTube, but simulcasting it over on Gun Channels, and he's got quite a few people watching that. They're talking about mental illness and firearms, so um, we might see some people jump in from that show when it's over. It sounds like Dead Horse is going to do a show after this one where you're going to be reloading some shotgun shells live with uh, David, I'm sure, and whoever else wants to jump in and kind of be part of that. Um, you've reloaded shotgun shells before, right? This isn't a first time or anything. This is my first time ever reloading shotgun shells. Oh, snap. So he's going to bust his, uh, his his gauge. Yep. Uh, is that even legal on YouTube? Or maybe do it on guntube.org. Everything's legal over there. All right. Well, so it's this Monday, right? Yeah, so uh, this means it's episode, I guess I could look over at the uh, thing over here, at the schedule. It is episode number, I was taking forever to look. Oh, my internet bad? Am I coming through, Claire? 631, episode 631. Thanks, yeah, episode 631. So on Mondays we talk about behind the scenes and we talk about the calendar. So uh, unless anybody's got anything to chat about from over the weekend or one of the earlier shows. Um, I haven't really heard any gun news really this weekend. Um, nothing pro or anti two A really. It's kind of, it was kind of a quiet weekend, which was kind of nice. Yeah, I have to agree. I didn't read anything pro or against. I'm still working on against sixteen thirty nine, and I I do a thing uh, tomorrow for call, the call center for him. Well, I did read that one of the Democratic senators or congressmen or whatever you call them in Oklahoma, our state, introduced a red flag law bill. So that's thrilling. Uh, like a bad one or just an annoying one? Um, just I didn't I haven't read it yet. I just barely saw the thing last night and I haven't had a chance yet, but I will. I'm sure it won't go anywhere, but just need to make sure it doesn't. I'm sure it's bad, though. Um, all right. Well, we've got a couple of things here. One of the things I wanted to start doing with this nightly conversation, since we do host it over on gun channels, uh, most of the people I'm guessing that watch the show, wow, we've only had seven viewers tonight. So this is the hardest of core viewers. Our real audience is out there tonight. All the, uh, the people that prefer Alice over the DGS haven't even come over yet. So uh, normally, though, I'm guessing everybody that watches this show is uh, part of gun channels or at least aware of stuff that's going on, all the shenanigans going on over at gun channels. Uh, I put in the topic tonight, Sharpie Knife Fight, because I'd like to uh, put a request out there for people to uh, send in some stories of gun ch your, your experiences with gun channels. Uh, some of you are newer to gun channels. Some of you have been around for two years or more. So i um, curious to see, I don't know, some different stories that are going on out there. Uh, 
I don't know what to do with them. I just think if you need to get some accumulated, we got the 50th anniversary coming up. Uh, I've been doing some of the cartooning kind of stuff, trying to get the ball rolling on that. There's got to be other creative people out there that are interested in uh, participating in some sort of, uh, um, you know, getting, I don't know, something out of these stories or something or using it to just play with, uh, you know, the community that we've got here a little bit. So uh, through the Sharpie knife, knife, Sharpie marker and knife fight out there, uh, but we don't. I don't know if we have anybody here that was. Well, I don't think we have anybody here that was there, but uh, I'm not sure if anybody who's. Oh, I watched it. I watched that all go down now. <laughs> live. So you were there yeah, watching. Yeah, live the Sharpie marker knife fight. Hell yeah, we were watching that live. So uh, with that and with that kind of preface that we're going to be talking about in upcoming shows. Um, Maybe not every Monday, but kind of randomly coming up just every once in a while, getting ready for the 50th anniversary. Talk about different things that happened over on gun channels to remind people, hopefully, of the fun stuff that's happened or to let people know about some of these neat things that happened, which is, I think, part of the funnest stuff about gun channels. I mean, I didn't build gun channels to make money. Uh, thankfully, there's enough participation financially that it doesn't cost me anything or much each month uh, other than time, really. So uh, I didn't build it with that in mind. Uh, I didn't build it. I, I mean, I did build it to remove the NFA, but, you know, we have every second matters to help kind of work towards that. So it's not like we have a huge goal or drive with, every, with gun channels other than to have a conversation about guns. So some of these things that happen in real life, and there's some of these things that have happened in chats or just, you know, over the years uh, online that we'll, we'll talk about in this segment or these, these segments. Um, I just don't want them to be forgotten. And it's always fun when people who have participated in them are around to reminisce. Uh, but hopefully, again, that gets people's creative juices flowing and, you know, who knows what will happen next kind of thing. So going back to the Sharpie knife fight, uh, Dave, I'm guessing you have no idea what we're talking about. No, G, I actually don't. I uh, kind of put my head in the sand this weekend because my girl was leaving for a couple week vacation oh, in no, Europe. So I had to spend time this close to the house. This is at least two years old. This is something we're going to get out Dead horse so out live uh, woods. You know what we're talking about here? No, I didn't. I didn't see it. Uh, I've had. I've been in a chat where you guys referred to it before, but I'm not sure what it is. Okay, and then snob. Any idea what we're talking about here? Absolutely no clue. All right, so then I'll watch out on the uh, chats out there. We are watching the YouTube side because of contractual obligations. I have to watch the YouTube side. But we're also watching the gun channel side where we actually are enjoying the lots of conversation that's going on live out there. Uh, wondering if um, people want to throw something out there. But till then, Dead Horse, what was the Sharpie, nar Sharpie marker knife fight all about? This was, for, it started two years prior, probably before it even happened, with Bob and Hosh talking one night in a chat about how Bob could basically disarm Hosh if Hosh attacked him with like a knife, right? And, and it was basically a little argument back and forth, like, oh, like if you're, how bad are you going to get hurt if someone comes at you with a knife or kind of like, oh, no matter what, like I think Hosh's perspective was no matter what, you're going to get cut, right? Trying to take away a knife from somebody. And Bob was of the aspect of like, oh no, I can take a knife away from you without getting hurt. So when they finally met up down at uh, Vegas, right? They were like, oh, like here's a Sharpie in, in place of the knife. And Bob dressed all up in white painter like clothes, right? Like the jumpsuit, the white painter jumpsuit. So then you could see any little black Sharpie marks on him, right? Like if he actually got, and so if he had a black Sharpie mark, that would represent like getting cut with the blade of a knife, right? So then they went and uh, did their little thing. And Bob, I think, turned around basically and ran and then tripped and like hurt himself really bad. <laughs> Oh, it's probably not funny to laugh at it about his injury, but, uh, but yeah, they were just uh, good times. It was a good time. So that was like a, a, a two year thing that finally got settled one night, like a two year dispute that got, that got settled in a uh, mutual combat one night. Yeah. It probably yeah. would be better if I found the video out there, but if anybody can find it or knows where it's at, I don't, I'm guessing it's on like pink's channel Pink's. or, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so basically everybody knows Bob, right? Biker Bob, co-host of this show back in the day. 
and famous Gun Channels Canadian. So uh, Bob has uh, got all kinds of ideas and uh, theories, and Hosh is what a rocket scientist, literally in California, and they'd have this off and on debate. I think over the years, like yeah, Bob is basically uh, into martial arts and he would say that you can disarm somebody by like taking their knee out or something. I think his thing was like, you know, most of the stuff is fake. We're maybe talking about movies or something like in real life, he would just take their knee out and the fight would be over. So I think it was something like that. And Hosh was like, not if I had a knife, right? And it went back and forth. And every once in a while, the, that little conversation would brew back up again every once in a while in a chat. So uh, we're at SHOT Show. I think this is the second year Bob had been come down from Canada to go to a SHOT Show and hang out in the United States for a while. And uh, he was already staying. He, so he was in Vegas staying at a mobile home park. And it's a fancy one with, like, blacktop streets. You know, it's not a uh, gravel anywhere. It's, it's grass and concrete and blacktop, and it's all nice. And uh, next to a casino. So it's, I think we all showed up to eat at that casino, I think. And so we had all showed up and we were all kind of parking in the empty camping spots or whatever, RV spots around Bob's camper to go over to the casino real close by. And that's when somebody said, hey, we should have the Sharpie marker knife fight. Because somewhere along the line, the knife fight concept had turned into like, if we ever meet, um, we're having a Sharpie marker fight. And whoever gets the, you know, whoever's actually the better knife fighter will have no markers, marks on them, right? So Bob's like, oh, damn. So he had, I don't know if he'd intentionally brought or if he just happened to have a, a pure white, like you're saying, a painter's jumpsuit or whatever. And uh, so he puts the head on. And this is like 10 o'clock at night or something. It's pretty late and it's dark. And the only lights are these little, I don't know what you call them, like what you'd have out by your sidewalk or something at your house, like a little light about the size, about head height, right? That just puts out a little bit of light so that as you're walking, you don't trip over shit, but not street lights up in the air or nothing like that. So it's really dark and it's, it's blacktop and everything, but it isn't necessarily completely level. It's a little bit of an incline to it. So they decided to have this Sharpie marker fight. I don't think anybody's drunk or anything. Bob might be drunk. No, Bob, Bob had, had some, had some drinks. drinks. Bob was probably a couple of beers in, but not like trash drunk or nothing. No, just I don't think just it's happy. No. So, um, yeah, so they got near a light, and everybody had their cell phones going, and I guess we were probably live at least twice, like probably live on two different channels, and uh, everybody was having a good time, and then they start the, the, the what do they call that, the, the face-off or like the, the fight, and... Uh, and Bob was trying to do something funny. I think he was basically trying to say, here's how you win a fight, and you always win. And he was going to turn around and run away, right, and be funny. But he didn't realize that there was an incline, so he fucking kind of tripped and fell down. And we didn't know it, but he really bashed his knee or something, right? So now he's got, like, a bashed knee, and he's getting back up to, like, have the real fight. And I don't really remember what happened, so I was holding the camera. But I'm pretty sure he got wailed on by the marker, right? Yeah, oh yeah, there was definitely a couple marker cuts on him, right? But like he was already hurt. Like he his knee, I saw pictures of his knee, like his knee was like pretty gashed open. It was pretty yeah, it's, uh, it's a Canadian. So he's like, Oh, I hurt my knee. And then later he shows us his knee and it's like, you know, other people would have probably gone to the hospital and got at least a stitch or two, right? At least wash some of the gravel and shit out of it. Like, it looked pretty bad. It really did. <laughs> it wasn't just, like, a little cut or something. It was pretty bad. Like, yeah, he probably could have gotten some stitches. So, anyway, that was a pretty fun evening. So, that was pretty fun shot show, too. That was Marco and Pink, and they were in Pink. So they had met up in Phoenix and drove around some sort of race car that Pink got as a rental. And then they had picked up Smeggy and... Somebody else, I think. No, not Smeggy. Smeggy never been to Shot Show. Somebody else. Who all was there? We were there. And then basically, we were all there for Shot Show. And then Hosh came to Vegas to meet up with his wife. And it was like spur of the moment. He hadn't expected to do it, but he like had a place to stay for free because his wife was already in Vegas. And he knew we were all there for Shot Show. So he was like able to, I guess, get a quick flight out and then be there and hang out for a little bit with everybody. And it was kind of fun. Well, he didn't get to go to SHOT Show or nothing, but uh, 
Yeah, it's the same. Whose channel is the video on? Probably Pink's. I don't know if I don't guess Pink's not out there right now. Pink. I, I think one was on Pink's and one was on. Uh, so there was two of them. I remember specifically there was two different angles. There was like two different live streams go going on. So someone else has it too, but uh, I know Pink for sure. Now, steadily saying he's been here for two years, and he doesn't recall that. So um, two years, he probably would have got an invitation to it. But it was um, probably not this year's SHOT Show for sure. And it wasn't last year. So it had to be 2016 SHOT Show? Yeah, it was 2016. Edge was not at SHOT Show. We keep trying to get Edge to go to SHOT. But, so. There was a bunch of people there. Though. I'm trying, I know I'm forgetting somebody. Oh, you know who it was? Darren. Yep, it was Darren. He used to live in Vegas. Yep. But then there was somebody else. The other there. Yeah. Anyway, pretty fun time. So that was one of those little stories. And I'm sure there's lots of them out there with everybody getting together. I'm sure they had, there was some actually some pretty fun ones from the NRA one that they all went to. Uh, some kind of shadiness in the parking lot, if I remember. So hopefully we'll get some of these stories and who knows, people can come up with some creative ways to uh, have fun with them. With that, we'll go to our member of the day. Every day we try to feature one of the members over at Gun Channels. Gun Channels has been around for five years now, and it is the people that are there. It's the this, this software. is nothing. It's just a software to run a community or whatever. It's just, uh, you know, we organize it into channels. So Gun Channels is the members. We try to feature them each day. And today we're kind of looking back again to a good guy. I don't know how many people are going to remember good guy, but you probably hear us talking about him once in a while. Um, but good guy with a gun was a uh, MP. So him and me both went to uh, Leonard Wood. So uh, that was kind of interesting. Many years apart. But anyway, then he lived up in Arizona. So are up in Goodyear. So uh, kind of east of Phoenix. And he shot at the range that's kind of between Phoenix and Tucson. So a couple of times we met up there. Ended up selling him a couple of guns and buying a couple of guns off of him. And uh, he got all into reloading for a while there and then into melting his own lead and then powder coating and of course sharing that with everybody in the live chats and in his videos and stuff uh he was some kind of tech support i think so he was savvy with computers and stuff and he was able to uh you know uh, he was able to get his information up on the web pretty well uh and then he was uh like i say real uh, he, he was real uh, open with his learning and uh kind of collaborating with you guys as he we discover the stuff about reloading and stuff. So really, again, one of the people that we built gun channels for, somebody like that who wanted to just you know, have some fun uh, building stuff. Unfortunately, his interest moved on, I think. Uh, lots of different theories on what, you know, where, what became of them. But, uh, you know, again, that's what, a, that's what a community is all about. We want to build a place where people can uh, enjoy it when they want to. And if they're not interested, you know, there's no obligation. They can move on. But they know that the place is here, and I'm sure if we ever had to, he'd be back to, uh, you know, help get the Second Amendment messages going. And uh, like I said, that's what I try to do is remember a good guy, or remember members, and today it's a good guy. Yeah, I still see him around once in a while on social media because he, he uses the same little symbol in a lot of places. And uh, so once in a while, I'll read a comment from him off of the YouTube or something like that, and I... You know, I remember the chats he used to be in. That guy was really funny. Yeah. Like every chat he was in seemed to be a good time. Oh, yeah. He had a great uh, Yeah. It was back in the day of the Yankee hanging out in chats. And, yeah, he got a nickname he didn't like too much. That one, but he used to go to Walmarts all the time. And be, someone, who was it that called that called him at the Walmart? I did one time. <laughs> and I said, like, <laughs> I, I can't remember what the hell name we used, though, but he did. It, we heard it go over the, the speaker, but he was talking right at the time it went through, so he didn't, like, hear the announcement. And then when we called back, they wouldn't announce it. Oh, that's funny. Oh, and then the coyote. Oh, the coyote is the car. The coyote with the dog call. <laughs> like, didn't he drive? Like, he's like, oh, I think I, like, his, like he just kept driving, right? Like, it was just, like, stuck in his thing. He just kept driving. I think I felt yeah. annoying. That was pretty awesome. All right. So uh, every day we try to feature a member. We've got a bunch of them in the um, 
schedule here, but we can always shuffle it around. So if you've got somebody you'd like to uh, see featured, uh, drop us an email, dailygunshow at gmail.com. And we can move on to the next segment of the show, which will be... Um, what does this say that for? So I guess it'll be our uh, gun shop of the day, which today is a museum, and it's called Dragon Man's. It's called Dragon Land, uh, but uh, also call it Dragon Man's Place. And uh, I think I got some pictures here on Instagram that we'll flip through. I don't know if everybody's familiar with it or not, but uh, I can't. I think I've heard of this guy before back in the day because you hear about this guy who has a bunch of machine guns, but I never really put two and two together until I was coming back from on the big trip coming back from uh, Oklahoma City, and I was sick of driving the same route from Oklahoma City to Tucson. So there's really no gun shops, or at least no new gun shops along the way. Uh, so I was thinking about going up to Dodge City and into uh, Colorado to come down a different way to Albuquerque, and that would get, let me pass the Red Dawn place and the NRA range and stuff. And uh, whenever I was coming, you know, mapping it out, I found out about this Dragon Man's place and. I went by and stopped by and checked it out and was amazed. I'm so glad I checked it out. Um, if you've listened to me before, I definitely have been to a lot of the museums. I think this is the best museum, hands down. There's no way this picture does this justice. This looks like a G.I. Joe diorama or something, but this is all legit actual surplus. And this is a massive 40,000 square foot, I think, building. And it's his own personal collection. There's no glass or bars or nothing. You're just right here with all of his stuff. That's a Ma Deuce and it's fully NFA and that's live ammo in it. Like everything is legit real. And it's just, an, it's a, it's an experience to be in that room. I've been in museums before and it's just not the same when you know that the stuff is neutered and you know it's behind glass. Um, and it might actually be some really neat thing, but you know they ruined it. This is the opposite. Everything in here he could take out, and he does take out, you know, to his own property and shoots it, or he drives it around, and takes it out, and shoots stuff. So it's just really neat. Uh, he's the coolest dude ever. If you go through the museum, you're taking the tour with him. So that's another experience that you'd need to check out. And like I say, these pictures just don't do it justice. So, you know, I've seen complete um, sets of things from the various theaters and campaigns throughout the history, but never all in one place in just a dude's collection where he just, you know, he's just there talking about it, how he acquired it. Yeah, the, the shoe polish. Look at that. Shoe polish. Dude, that's like, every collection of shoe polish. that's like every boot from World War II. Like, it's amazing. Such yeah. a complete collection. He also has the nickname of the most heavily armed man in, in America, right? That's that's There he is right there. Yeah, that's him. This is the room where he has every single, I think, every single uniform from World War II, which is a massive number of them. It's just a cool dude. Um, and the fact that he's out there doing it and and having fun with it is just all inspirational. So uh, one of the reasons we do the show on the daily is to talk about gun shops and gun shows or gun related stuff. And this is a gun shop. You can go buy stuff from him. And, uh, and he's got this museum. It's open on Sundays. Uh, the tour is done by him and it's amazing and it's again it's an incredible experience to just be in a, a massive private collection that he's willing to share with everybody and again there's just no way to to show the scale of it i've only seen a portion of it i can't wait to get back and actually see the whole thing uh, Gee. Got, yeah um this fella he actually has the largest collection of uh german um ss troopers uh uniforms in the world and he is a hundred percent jewish and he has been a collector since he was a little boy i saw an entire show on this gentleman and he seems like a very educated man on the war and his collection and each item where it came from as well yeah, yeah, that's the best part, is it's his collection, not just some curator of a museum who's aware of certain things for whatever reasons. This guy has acquired it all himself. He's the dude. And like you say, he's he's awesome. It's just an amazing experience. He, I can't explain enough. He'll be, there's a basically a section of his museum for each campaign, um, basically from World War II to now. Um, I don't think he has Revolutionary War stuff, but I don't know. I haven't seen the whole thing. When we went through, basically what happened is I got there on like a Thursday or something. The museum's typically only open on a Sunday. 
but this was right after like the end of my big uh road trip was right after or the last couple of days of the road trip was las vegas issue you know that asshole in las vegas so um a news crew had come out to his place from oh i forget brazil or something or peru or brazil or something down there and it was like a news crew and they wanted to do a, a thing and he was doing some pieces for them some bits on what a bump fire stock was and then he's like hey you want to see the museum to this news crew and i said hey i'm i'm a youtube guy do you mind if i go with as you go through the museum and he said yeah sure and there was a family there who just happened to be there to see the place and he said hey you want to go too and he just took us all on this free tour of about a third of the museum and he gets into the room with the world war ii stuff and like you say, he's got a really impressive, complete collection. And he was telling us about his uniforms and stuff. And then he uh, he says, I also got the largest collection of Zylon. What's it called? Like Zylon Z or whatever, Zylon, whatever that, the gas is. And he brought, he opened up a cabinet like you see here. It's one of these glass cabinets. And he pulled out a canister. And he goes, listen to this. And he shakes the canister. And he's like, if I open this, we'd all die. <laughs> and it's a freaking Nazi freaking gas freaking canister got like 26 of them and they're just in that case with all this other stuff it's just amazing he's got the the belt buckle gun that the nazis special whatever the hell guy guarded hitler with you can yeah. own those cans of gas he's got 26 of them <laughs> jeez i wonder what kind of hoops well, you, he can, had you, can, you can only do their material with the right licenses you know what i mean it's not so like, this yeah, with the right licensing, like, how do you think companies work with, like, dangerous gases and chemicals and all? It's just all about the right paperwork and stuff, right? So, the so, Special Forces group is in Carl, Fort Carlson, right near there, and he's got a relationship with some of those guys. So, he's got some stuff that has been, like, prototypes, and, you know, if they, they get stuff to, to test out, they'll give him one, you know, that kind of thing. That he's, so, he's got some, he's got a lot of uh, respect and um what do you say like networking you know he knows a lot of people so i can't imagine too many you know what i'm saying he's he's probably got some anyway it's an awesome place can't recommend it enough it's not open all year it's only open during like summer months so if you can get yourself to colorado springs check it out totally worth it um you're about two hours north three hours north of the nra whittingham center which is a cool museum it's okay it's an okay museum i shouldn't say cool no it's nothing like this scale it's an okay museum, and then it's a pretty impressive shooting range down there, which, you know, if you do get a chance to get out to that, this might be a, a day side trip from it. And if you are at that NRA place, which says it's in New Mexico, but just south of this. The Whit the Whit Whittington Center? Yeah, Whittingham, I that's think. That's all mainly hunting, though. Like, that's what that's big for is hunting. Hunting and sporting. Hunting. There's a lot of sports yeah. there, too. But you can camp there. You can rent little cottages, and you can – we could do, like, a gun channels thing out there sometime. And anyway, this is, I'm just saying, this is within like a day's trip of there if you're ever there, or that is a day's trip of Colorado Springs if you're ever there. And then FYI, that's about two hours north of Red Dawn, where they filmed all the Red Dawn stuff. So anyway, uh, this is a pretty cool spot and almost never saw it before. And luckily, I just decided to uh, come back a different way. And that's why you should always take a different route home. Don't always take the same route home. Okay, so I have an important question. What did this guy do for a living? Because you said that's all privately owned. So he's got don't a ask, lot of don't money, tell. Oh no, apparently he was uh, motorcycles and stuff. He's called Dragon Man because he has like a fancy Harley with like an elaborate dragon motif to it. Uh, I guess he did some sort of automobile stuff. He's a big portion of his museum is like Elvis fifties diner, fifties cars. Uh, I don't know nothing about cars other than like you know they look like fifty seven Chevys or like. Um, cars from like happy days and stuff but he's got a ton of those like a lot so i'm sure he did something with automobiles and stuff and then here's the thing about nfa uh, if you were into nfa and 86 happened there i mean there's lots of there's lots and lots and lots of potential to make money with nfa items so somebody who you know after world war ii let's say or after some campaign pre-1986 when full auto was transferable decided i'm gonna buy a crate of those you know for a hundred dollars a piece or something and then post and uh post hughes amendment that item is now worth three thousand six thousand sixty thousand i know guys that bought m2s pre-86 
you know, for like five grand and they thought they were spending a lot of money on a 50 caliber full auto belt fed gun from FN, right? And they sold them for $56,000. So imagine if you bought a bunch of them. So there's ways that people make money on NFA items. And a lot of times you can get NFA items now that aren't transferable, you know, that are made for uh, SOTs or for, you know, yeah. Where Dragon Man, uh, the thing that I read on him is where he got all of his money is he does a mail order business. And he makes over like half a million dollars a year with some sort of mail order business. Oh, really? So, yeah. So that's where he got all of his money. And then his amusement park, which basically that's what it is, is it's you got a, a, a museum. You yeah. got like a yeah. paintball thing. You got a motocross track. You got like a diner. You got a drive in. There's, like, no there's a whole bunch of stuff out there, right? I don't think there's a time. Yeah, it's 10 miles of racetrack for BMX racing, so there's that. Yeah. And there's a bunch of ranges, people. But the thing is, like, the BMX track is $25 a year to be a member, and you just come out there whenever you want and drive. <laughs> so it's not but like yeah, but, but then if they have races out there on Friday nights, then it's another 20 bucks per race and stuff like that, right? So the thing I read, I'm pretty sure that they said that just his amusement park setup thing that he has going on there makes like three hundred thousand a year. So, so it sounds like he's making money. Like, like it sounds like just like that museum and all that. Like he's not losing money on that. It sounds like if if anything, if worst case scenario, it sounds like he's probably at least breaking even with it. If not, still making a little. Sounds like he's got a lot of different forms of like passive income yeah so like if bmx isn't hot that year like he like motocross there's you know you know that and then the gun museum to fall back on the shooting ranges the paintball fields the i think there's a drive-in out there i think he has a drive-in where he plays old drive-in movies like movies from like the 50s and stuff like the original drive-in movies well that and would make fun. I'm definitely into that kind of stuff yeah, so he plays these movies from like the 50s and stuff and people come out there. So he has other sources of income. You know, he might lose money on some of them, but his mail order business alone is supposed to be a half a million dollar a year business that he makes. And I've always wondered what mail order business it is. Is it like a gun thing or a surplus thing? I'm guessing it's probably some kind of surplus thing. And probably he probably that. It could be. Yeah, so... He just probably got big into the surplus game and going to the army military auctions and stuff like that, probably. And Eva, I mean, uh, steadily makes a good point. Eva from Gun Funny is his daughter. So I didn't know that. That was pretty cool. Yeah, she doesn't make like. I don't know who that is. Yeah, she. Yeah, like, I follow, she follows me on Instagram. I know who that is. She's a podcast. It's like a well, Gun Funny, right? It's like a funny podcast. They do crank calls. I think it's once a week. Uh, anyway, it's like two girls and a dude from We Like Duty. She's Sean Heron's girlfriend or whatever. They're um, uh, in Colorado Springs also. Anyway, she doesn't make a big deal about it. She, every once in a while, I mean, they're always out at that range, but she doesn't make like a big deal about it. But um, that's what I mean. I'm guessing every once in a while when you see her like on a tank or something, it's probably her, her tank, right? <laughs> All right, well, so um, what was that? That was our gun shop of the day. Uh, let's go dig into the calendar over on Gun Channel, see what's happening, what's coming up. So we have a calendar over there, and the whole point is to uh, let people know what's coming up, but also to help enhance those events. So on Mondays, we talk about behind the scenes, and I'll mention again, I haven't done it in a while. When you post something like an event on a place like Gun Channels, which gets, I don't know, 30,000 views a day, that helps that event out to some extent on the back side of the internet, which is doing all kinds of math and figuring out how popular something is, how worthy it is to be recommended as a search result based on how often it's recommended, you know, how often it's used out there on the internet. So CycleCamp is a great advocate for putting his uh, Connecticut Citizens Defense League events up here that helps that event because they're up in Connecticut and here's gun channels being hosted out of somewhere. You know, but people accessing it from all over the country and world, I guess. And uh, again, with substantial numbers. So um, that's going to help that event out. If somebody in Connecticut's typing in what to do this weekend, hopefully it will help influence the Internet's you know, decision on whether or not to recommend something like this. So anyway, that's why we uh, encourage people to use it. Then, of course, anybody who jumps into gun channels and scrolls down a little bit, 
has the potential of seeing something over here. If you're going to be traveling or if you're, uh, I don't know, going to be recommending something to somebody, maybe you see something here like the bullpup shoot happening in Illinois. Maybe uh, two weeks from now, some friend of yours says they're going to be visiting Illinois and they're going to be bored. Maybe you can help connect them with a cool something to do. So there's a couple of reasons to post things here. So we encourage you to do it. Of course, it doesn't cost anything except a couple of minutes of your time to do it. Uh, so looking at the calendar, we've got a uh, um, cycle posted primary election day. I guess that's different for different people. So you probably put in a span of days for that one. Uh, we got his picnic, like we said, and the poker run, which are a couple of events uh, that um, they do, I guess, annually. We got this bull pub shoot that I just mentioned that's uh, held by Manicor Arms and some other people at a place called The Site in Illinois. It's kind of out in the middle of nowhere near the Mississippi River. Pretty interesting event, though, where you get to uh, ch ch chat and check out the manufacturer's wares, you know, the different stuff that they make, kind of like in a open air outside type of gun show environment and then you can go down the hill and pull triggers i think it costs a couple of bucks as a participant to pull triggers but you know nominal and really it's a neat opportunity to uh to pull triggers on stuff that maybe isn't for rent or isn't for rent yet at local ranges uh so if you can get to it, it might be interesting they call it a bullpup shoot but there's i think there's more stuff there than just bullpups uh, we got the gun rights policy conference coming up in Chicago on, in September as well. And that's where all the gun owners rights groups get together, meet up for a couple of days. Uh, people that are interested can meet up the day before at a thing called the, uh, they called the 2A Media Summit or something like that, uh, where you, they'll get together and try to um, help people do better with their um, content creation. Anyway, then the gun owners' rights groups get together for a couple of days. You know, it's held by the Second Amendment Foundation and the uh, Citizens Committee to, uh, yeah, Citizens Committee Keeping Bear Arms. Um, they've been doing that for 30-something years. It's an amazing thing. If you travel at all during the year, this is the thing that you might want to consider traveling to, even though it's in Chicago. Uh, 2018 Southeast Outdoor press association so i found this when i was looking for press credentials uh, if you're interested in getting press credentials for whatever reasons you might want to get them uh, this is an organization that's been around for a long time so you might want to check out their conference i have no idea what it's like but it's in looks like that they consider the southeast is everything from texas and missouri arkansas and everything out east from there so if anybody's out there and attends this i'd be certainly interested to find out more about what it's like Got Knob Creek, one of the big machine gun shoots that happens in October. We got the National Association of Sporting Goods Wholesalers, which is a very small, well, a smaller shot show uh, that happens, I don't know where, I think Missouri in October. And then the Big Sandy is another uh, shooting, outdoor shooting uh, weekend here in Arizona. A lot of stuff coming up in the next well, a couple of months, but not much stuff in August. So I don't know if it's too hot or what, but if anybody knows anything that's uh, happening in August, I encourage you to put it in the calendar so that we can help uh, you know, amplify it or talk about it here. And if you're doing shows and you're looking for stuff to talk about on those shows, consider checking out the calendar and helping to send these things out there. Anybody else got any events to talk about? Anything you're doing or going to? wish you could go to i'm going to be probably trying to make it back down to texas here because the place said that they won't just like take keep my deposit if i can make it back down there so i'm trying to swing to make it back down there uh probably um hopefully labor day weekend I Why wish not? I could go to any of them, <laughs> but no, it's not in the cards for me. Hopefully you don't have a huge fire whenever you go to <coughs> this time, Dead Horse. Yeah, I, it'll be nice. So hopefully everything might go smooth this time. and Just wait till it's raining and go away when it's raining. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing a call center thing with the anti-1639 here in Washington to... Try to get word out to get people to vote against it. 
Right on. Is that going to be like they give you a script and then you go with that script, or is it like you call people and wing it? Or I've, I've never been before. I'll report back when I, I know more. But uh, every time I've ever done it before for like school districts, it's always there's a script. Um, but it's not too far from my house, and it's the least I can do. So uh, my plan is to go once a week. Right on. And unfortunately, that's one of those things that you have to really do up there. Um, nobody said being vigilant was awesome or rewarding or pleasant or convenient or easy or cheap, right? And like a lot of things, it sucks. So uh, yeah, bravo or congratulations because uh, yeah, that's how they asked. So that's how Bloomberg, he paid a bunch of people to do what you're gonna go do for nothing. He paid them to basically do the same thing for evil and got horrible shit passed in, in your state that way. Yeah, amen. But luckily I've done enough of it for school districts. I'm pretty used to, you know, having people be rude or hang up on me, so it's not that big of a deal to me. Well, that's why I was asking about the script thing, because I would think somebody like yourself who's adaptable and like, you know, able to communicate and quick on your feet could potentially do better just sort of going out, you know, go do it instead of say this when the phone gets answered well i mean let's be honest i'm not always going to follow the script because I, I i know how these things work and if you've got somebody that's you know kind of in between you can use you can use your use those and you know part of intelligent part of your brain and make a good argument and you know stay with logic and stuff you know all right so um Good on you. I guess um, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Anything else we want to talk about tonight? I'm going shooting uh, the 1st of September, uh, hog hunting. In Florida? Yes, sir. In a helicopter? Uh, no, it didn't play into the cards this time because of the cost. How much? The fuel. How much? Uh, helicopter? Well, the, the helicopter, actually, I know someone that has one. Um, and basically we have to fill out, if you all want to do this, we can do this, but we don't have to chip in on fuel, but we have to fill out hold harmlesses in case, you know, the worst thing happens, the crashes that we can't sue, our families can't sue just because of the, the amount of ground clearance, because we'll be at like 50 to a hundred feet and things happen you know at low altitude you don't have very much time to auto rotate and the guy's uh an ex-vietnam helicopter pilot so i he's very good at flying a helicopter and um basically uh if you guys are interested in doing such a thing we can plan to do that i just can't afford you know to f pay for the amount of fuel that would be needed to go and what? do that well, when I checked into the place at Texas, it was 850, but they didn't guarantee that you were going to get a hog when they went, took you out. And then for like $1,400, they guaranteed like they would take you out as many times as, as it took until you got like your hogs. So Are you talking it was 850 bucks and $1,400. Are you talking that kind of money, David? Or? Um, yeah, you're probably looking at that and fuel for a whole like eight, maybe nine hour day. Oh no! Like this is like this is like the the eight hundred and fifty dollar trip is like a thirty minute thing. If you uh, don't get it in thirty minutes, you're done. But if you pay fourteen hundred dollars, if you don't get it in the thirty minutes, like when they run out of fuel or whatever, or, or like they'll come back refill and take you out again. Like they're you're guaranteed that they're gonna get you a hog, but. When you pay the eight fifty at the end of your thirty minutes or whatever, like if you don't got a hog, then you don't get a hog. You just lost eight hundred and fifty bucks. Like that's that. That's why I was like, ah, oh, fuck. That's kind of like you know shitty, right? To pay that kind of money. So then you're like, feel like you have to pay the fourteen hundred just so you're guaranteed to get something, right? No, here's my thing. I don't care about shooting a pig at all, but if you're going to take me up in a helicopter, I want to be guaranteed I'm shooting out of it. So what I want is a bunch of iron targets out there, maybe something else like toilets. How awesome would it be to shoot toilets from out there? That's a reactive target. I don't know. Clay. Maybe a or something. Clay then, pots. 
oh, like if maybe somebody throws some clay, so you have to shoot at a moving target with a shotgun from a helicopter. I don't give a damn about the pigs. If somebody will just fly me around and let me shoot out of their helicopter. That's what the fuck I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. I want to join up for that. But uh, back to um, David in Florida. Here's the thing. I'll sign that waiver, but if he drops me out the helicopter and I fall down, I'm going to immediately get up and shoot him because of Castle Doctrine. <laughs> Yeah, you wear a real good <laughs> harness. You, you you wear a really good harness. You're you're uh, not coming out of that helicopter, you know, unless you know, because you will have your foot, your feet out on the run, because you've got to lean out over the edge. Because when you fire off the left side of the chopper, I tend to fire off the right. But if you do off the left, you don't want to hit him with brass. Because, you know, you don't want to get hot brass down your neck or on your 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 uh, reproductive area uh, when fu- when piloting a helicopter at low altitudes. <laughs> what the hell? Is this guy naked when he's flying? Like, how's this hitting? No, he wears a... He <laughs> wears a flight. To fly. Well, he wears a Nomax flight suit, like what, you know, you wear when you fly a helicopter nowadays in the military. But I'm just saying, if you shoot brass and it goes down his neck or something, I mean, I th- he didn't tell me this, but I shot a couple pieces of brass up inside the, his cockpit, and he didn't seem too happy about it. And his daughter told me that, you know, that kind of pisses him off because, it you know, it can land on him or, you know, into the control units and stuff like that. So I just tend to lean way out when I'm on the left side. All right. Well, I can deal with my ejected brass not hitting him. Yeah. Hit out of side of his his helicopter. So, all right. Is this a this is a uh, Huey? No, 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 no. This is not a Huey. <laughs> I wish it was a Huey. A, that would you be know? pretty awesome. We could all go up at the same time to start winning. Yeah, that would be bad. But no, this is what they consider like an. Uh, uh, it's almost a experimental aircraft. They're that size. You can fit. Um, four people in it tightly you know usually it's him piloting and then you got one guy in the back with a camera and one guy in the back working the gun yeah that sounds like two gun channels people so is it like a little bubble helicopter yeah it's one of those like yeah real small ones but the good thing about it like a magnum no 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 no, not a little bell bell, those are half a million million dollar helicopters if for the no, the U- Magnum PI helicopter is just like that little bubble thing, right? Like, yeah, but it's a turbine helicopter mm-hmm. that cost about uh, seven hundred and eighty thousand dollars back in the eighties. Yeah, that Magnum PI helicopter ain't like a mash helicopter. No, no. It was a wicked cool like. Yeah, those helicopters are are capable of two hundred mile an hour, and they will do a actual loop. So what are we taking like talking one of these like homemade kit like gyrocopter? No, 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 no. It's not a gyrocopter. It is a true helicopter. It's got a collective. It's got pedals. It's got a yoke. It's just a smaller version of you know like a news helicopter, just a hell of a lot smaller, and it's cheaper to run. How do you say? And wouldn't the brass go up in there after you're done firing it? And that makes sense to me. Like, wouldn't you be worried about the brass just getting caught up in the guts of the helicopter or something? Well, basically, the downwash of the rotor forces everything kind of down. Um, when you are leaning, when you're kind of like trying to sit, at first, I was just sitting kind of on the seat with my feet on the runner. And that was kind of throwing the brass, like the the way the helicopter c- cuts through the air it kind of gives you a little bit of a bubble screen. And if you're inside that bubble screen and you fire the the weapon, it's not only really loud, but the brass seems to go right up into the cockpit area. But if you're standing out on the, on the run where you, the landing strip and you're leaning out and you fire, you're in the wind of the helicopter uh, going around it. And it seems to grab that brass and let it go down instead of, um, back into the pilot's compartment 
Hey, right. G-Webs, you've been to Big Sandy, so have you, when they're shooting the tracers at, like, super long range at, and you see one go out there, yeah. have you ever seen it, like, spin drift where kind of like that, the bullet's, like, corkscrewing in the air, right? Like, the bullet's actually kind of making, like, wide circles as it is like literally like corkscrewing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, when you shoot it, I've seen these videos where they shoot out of the helicopters with these tracers. It starts doing doing that immediately immediately like from the from that wash oh i see what you're saying yeah it starts corkscrewing and uh immediately from that wash so like i've heard that shooting from a helicopter can be like one of the most difficult things oh yeah in the yeah. world to like to do like <laughs> yeah because like uh, yeah. each side each side of the helicopter you have a different rotation so you have like a different wash so like you got to change up your whole game on where you shoot and where you hold just depending on what side of the helicopter you're shooting at plus if he's flying at 70 miles an hour and you start firing directly on a pig below you your bullets are going to hit in front of it so you have to you know you got to lead the lead the animal because you, or a target, you know, if you got a metal target you're coming up on, you can't aim at the target because you're moving 70 miles an hour. You start firing at that target. And by the time those bullets come out and make 25, 30 yards, they've already passed the target. So you kind of got to lay into it beforehand and start capping rounds and you'll see them start hooking right into the dirt and you'll see them catch it. And it's literally like curving, like dead sand. And, you know, it's, it's pretty cool, you know, but it's very, very hard. I, it took me like four or five times up before I could actually shoot and hit things on a, on a predictable level because of my eyesight problem. It took a little while to kind of figure out a way that I could make it work. So you're talking now, about what, one that looks like this? Yeah, what's the name brand of that? I don't know. Hughes 500 helicopter. No, it wouldn't be a Hughes, man. Hughes, that's big money. That 500 Hughes, that's 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 a ton of change. You guys have got rich itis. Um, put in there. It's one of the smallest commercial aircraft that you uh, helicopters you can buy. He told me that much. All right. Well, I'm gonna suggest we keep moving because. Gun yeah, gun. we don't want to get in a hole. But sounds cool. And yeah, more than I asked, you're going on hog hunting in Florida. I've heard a lot of people hunt out of helicopters because of somewhat, I guess, because of so much marshy conditions or whatever. It's a lot easier to hunt that way or only accessible some places that way. Yeah. Some of the time during the year, like coming up right now, it rains so much that if you were out there walking, you're even if you're wearing like boots that are made, you know, to walk in mud, you are like slopping and it's like trying to run it on a sand, um, you know, in the sand or in the water at the beach. It's just hard to do and it poops you out pretty quick. So just to go a couple of miles walking is, is actually really, it's like walking up a mountain. All right. Well, we'll end up the show here and uh, DTP found uh, the video of the Sharpie marker fight, Sharpie marker knife fight on Hosh's channel. So we got, uh, I'll screen share it here. We've got Bob mansplaining how to karate people. And this is where he was trying to be funny, but he accidentally fell there and did that sort of roll, which is actually pretty good for, he's like 97 years old and, you know, having kind of surprised himself and had to do like an ninja roll. I think he did pretty good. Let's see if we can get it on tape here. Let's get it in slow motion. So we'll do this speed, slow motion. So he's basically saying, here's the way to always win a fight, run away. Oh, see, he's had got ahead of him. Oh, oh, down that's kind of wise advice. Yeah. Well, his feet got crossed up when he went to go start running away. I think that was where he was doomed, kind of from the start. And it, it's not real obvious here, but this is a downhill. This is going down. I don't know if he realized it. So, yeah, but he is uh, kind of wearing those overalls over his regular clothes, so it's kind of constricting oh, yeah. him. It's yeah. kind of weird, you know. Like, Get underneath there, a whole Canadian tuxedo underneath there. 
his feet got all crossed up like as he was backing up too. So this is the actual fight. And it dramatically comes out of focus and then into focus. What the hell? We're like down the street. We're not even anywhere near Bob's camper even. This is actually a pretty good Sharpie fight. Better in slow motion, huh? Oh, Hosh is nailing him. Killed, killed. <laughs> right in the ribs right there. Oh, and then Bob uh, falls down. Uh, now he's bleeding out. Look at that. Complete head roll. <laughs> and Hosh is still neck knifing him. But Bob is Oh, see, if Bob was like really kicking right there, he would have like hit Hosh straight straight in the chin with that kick, like well, and Bob said, like, Bob's at such a disadvantage because he really can't hit. So, like, the person with the knife, <laughs> with the Sharpie, he needs to have padding and stuff on and a helmet so that he so can to make it fair. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's what Bob's uh, side of it still is. He contends that if he would have started the fight for real, he would have knocked Hosh in the knee, therefore crippling Hosh right at the back, right at the back. I agree. I think if if I think if Hosh would add padding on, so Bob could go full force on him, and actually, like, I think it would have turned out much different. So Bob basically got stabbed the shit out of. Let's see how the marker points. But Hosh also also kept going. Look, he even stabbed himself, and then he uh, he kept stabbing him when he was down, though. And that's a ninety-six year old man stabbing. Notice Bob didn't pull a gun. Bob didn't castle doctrine. So oh Hosh my god! <laughs> uh, I want to use that. Um, that was, I think, pink filming. How do you say he broke roast a rib? Did he break a rib also? He might have. Oh yeah, I think he did. Yeah. I think he did crack a rib too. Yep. He's right. right. He's laying around like that. That's the kind of crazy fun we have. When we're in bed. And that wasn't even nobody drinking. So that was just a ongoing feud that finally got to come out into reality. Next time they say they're both going to suit up and both have Sharpie marker knives and instead of that, like, try to... Bob basically was just trying to defend himself from getting stabbed to death. Instead, they're going to just have an actual knife fight. So you can stay tuned for that. All right, so um, I think we covered all the con contractual obligations of this show. Thanks, everybody, for sticking around. We try to uh, have a conversation each night. I guess we – did we start a little bit late as of Ellis? Or we start kind of on time? I think we went right about an hour tonight. Um, Cycle's not here. Does anybody have a quote? I looked one up. Benzie wasn't here. I got a Clint, Clint Smith – the two most important rules in a gunfight are yeah. hold on, always hold on. cheat. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, Dead Horse, you said you're doing a chat after this, reloading shotguns? Uh, yes, I am. I'm going to be reloading 12-gauge shotgun shells for the first time ever. Right on. So anybody wants to check that out, if you want to create your own show over on Gun Channels, feel free. If you want to uh, check out, um, let's see, Taters. He does stuff on Gun Channels all the time. Uh, Snob. You've been posting videos? I've seen a couple. Yeah. Check out your channel. Um, you guys can feel free if you want to drop links in the comments. Um, I'll make you moderators of the YouTube channel. And then that way you can feel free to drop links to your, your own channels, just like Gary's doing right now, um, that's on this thing. So if anybody watches this on a playback, they're going to see your link there, potentially click on it. But again, when we're talking about just having reciprocal links out there on the web, uh, we've got 800-something viewers on this channel. So if that helps you out, having a link out there, uh, great. You know, We're going to be promoting it on iTunes and all that. Thank you, sir. All right. So um, let's see. Make that horse a mod. And here's how you do that. If you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, I'm watching the YouTube side. YouTube's a dead and bloated video hosting platform where we, where we host this video, this, this stuff. 
So what I did when I went to Dead Horse's thing there, uh, I went to uh, create or add moderator or whatever. So I'll see if, um, like Aries already a moderator. There's Snob. So we'll go over here and make add moderator. Everybody see that? So that's how you make someone a moderator. It's how you give them this little blue wrench. Now with that wrench, they can clobber on all the regular people in the chat if they want to. So there you go. Who else is in there? Woods? Is Woods out there? Let's see if he's been saying anything. No, I'm, I haven't done anything in there. Okay. So uh, anyway, so that's how you can make people mods on your channels if you want. And uh, you guys can always feel free to drop stuff in there. Uh, like I say, that supplements the show and plugs whatever efforts you might be doing. Again, thanks everybody for joining. And sorry for cutting you off. I just want to let people know that there was another uh, show coming on after this one. Oh, you're good. So you ready for me to read it now? Yep, let's end it. All right. From Clint Smith. The two most important rules in a gunfight are always cheat and always win. The guys and gals of gunwebsites.com encourage you to take a CCW class every year, practice at least once a month, and carry every day. Thanks for watching gunwebsites.com. Thank <laughs> you.